How some carriers give you so little for your older busted phone you just end up living with it? I don't think so. Verizon lets you trade in your broken phone for a shiny new one. You break it, 
we upgrade it. You dunk it, doggy bone it, <laughs> slam it, wham it, strawberry jam it. We upgrade it. Get a 5G phone on us with select plans. Every customer, current, new, or business. Because everyone deserves better. And with plans starting at just $35, better costs less than you think. All right, folks, today is Monday, January 3rd, 2022, coming up on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Senator Chuck Schumer makes it clear that it is time to carve out uh, a voting rights exception with the filibuster. He said on January, by January 17th, they are going to move to make that happen. And we'll discuss with our panel also on today's show. Uh, Own has a new series, a documentary talking about uh, the issue of black women and infertility. We'll talk with the director of the documentary, Eggs Over Easy, Easy Plus, actress Keisha Knight Pulliam, who's involved with it as well. She's one of the executive producers. Also, a new poll suggests the uh, approval rating of Vice President Kamala Harris is up. But folks are not talking about that. But they always talk about when her numbers were down. Hmm. A white woman in Louisiana who was a judge, can't take using the N-word, uh, she's resigned. Hmm. Shed a tear. No. Uh, also, folks, uh, uh, Donald Trump's kids are refusing to cooperate with the civil investigation from the New York Attorney General. Mm, what's going to happen next in that case? Also, two new black mayors in New York City and Atlanta. They have now taken over. Plus, uh, Virginia Attorney General is suing a town for its racist practices. We'll tell you all about that. Plus, uh, we lost uh, some jewels. They've gone from elders to ancestors. Uh, we'll tell you about uh, Max Julian, plus the last living parent of the four girls who were murdered in the Birmingham bombing. Folks, it is time to bring the funk on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Let's go. He's got it. Whatever the miss, he's on it. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop, the fact, the fine. And when it breaks, he's right on time. And it's rolling. Best believe he's knowing. Putting it down from sports to news to politics. January 17th, that is a day that uh, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer says a vote is going to be held uh, in order to do a filibuster carve out for voting rights. Today, he sent a letter uh, to the United States Senate making perfectly clear exactly what he wants to see happen in the U.S. Senate. This is a copy uh, of that letter where he laid out uh, uh, in stark terms exactly what is happening in terms of dealing with democracy in America. This is what he said as we approach the anniversary of the January 6th attack on our capital and our democracy. I'm writing to follow up upon follow up on my last dear colleague before Christmas, specifically to outline next steps on urgently needed voting rights legislation. He makes clear that, that uh, democracy held as a result of what happened on uh, January 6th. But he, as he said, make no mistake about it, this week, Senate Democrats will make clear that what happened on January 6th and the one-sided partisan actions being taken by Republican state legislatures across the country are directly linked. And we can and must take strong action to stop this anti-democratic march, specifically as we honor the brave Capitol Police officers who defended us from those motivated by the big lie who tried to undo a fair and free election, Senate Democrats will continue to make the case for passing voting rights legislation to counter the Republican voter suppression and election nullification laws with the same anti-democratic motives born out of the big lie. Let's go to uh, my panel who joins us right now. I uh, want to bring uh, all of them up. Dr. Avis Jones, the Weaver, political analyst at the Omakongo Dabinga Professorial Lecture School of International Service, American University, Reverend Jeff Carr, founder uh, of uh, the Infinity Fellowship uh, in Nashville. Glad to have all of you. I want to go to you, Avis. Uh, finally, some action we're seeing from uh, Senator Schumer. He understands uh, that the pressure has been there. And for all of those people who, who, who said, oh, that uh, it's performative, if you will, uh, the protests, 
that have been going on. You've got the, the hunger strike of Joe Madison. Uh, you've got, uh, again, what Black Lives Matter have been doing, Poor People's Campaign, uh, seeing the CBC chair um, uh, being uh, arrested, uh, Joyce Beatty. Uh, no, that's the kind of stuff that was needed to put the pressure on Schumer to do this very thing. Absolutely. I mean, the reality is that voting, while important, is not enough. As I often say, voting is the starting gun to political action. It's not the finish line. And those things that you just detail are other examples of ways that all of us can get involved to move uh, legislation through that we know is absolutely needed. Now, my challenge is to Schumer. You know, I want it to be more than a letter. I'm hoping that that letter isn't performative. And, and here's why I say that. I don't have a great deal of confidence in his leadership, period, period, point blank, period. If Harry Reid was the uh, was the major was the majority leader, we'd already have this. OK, I, I just don't trust his leadership ability. So more than a letter, I want to feel confident that he's having the right discussions behind the scenes with those that have in the past stood in the way. Uh, until we actually get it across the finish line, which evidence that he's done what he needs to do behind the closed doors so that he can exert the pressure that needs to be exerted to pull all the Democrats in line, that's when I'll celebrate. That's the part of this equation that I'm, I'm scared might be performative, but we'll see what happens when he brings it up to the floor. Well, the, the, the problem here on Congo is real simple, and that is you have two senators who are on the record mm -hmm. as saying they are not going to support a carve out of ending the filibuster for voting rights. And that is uh, Senator Kristen Sinema of Arizona uh, and Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia. I've seen nothing to indicate they've mm -hmm. changed their mind. Yeah, absolutely. And I completely agree with what Dr. Avis was saying. And the reason why this vote needs to happen is because they need to be put on record and they need to be put on blast because all of these guys talk a good game. We just saw this with Build Back Better when people thought that that was going to be on board and that was going to pass. And then, of course, we saw what Senator Manchin did. And to be quite honest, I don't trust any of these guys to do. Well, I'm not going to say that. There, Most Democrats we know are on board with this, seriously, especially after the NAACP called out about 13 of them and they had to go on record and say that they were in agreement with this. But we need to make sure maybe what Schumer's intention is right now is that he wants people to continue to put pressure on cinema and Manchin to make sure that when this stuff comes up for a vote, that they are hearing from everybody. So that might be his intentions. Again, I agree with Dr. Avis, um, this should be instantaneous. There shouldn't be any more talk, but we cannot stop. We cannot have the mentality that just because he wrote this letter that all of a sudden it's gonna be taken care of. Because we know that the Republicans, they're not stopping. They're ramping up their efforts to make sure maybe get more contributions to Mansion, get more contributions to cinema. Maybe some of these corporate entities, the American Expresses and the AT&Ts are giving up some more of their money as well, like they've done with Mansion and others. And so we cannot stop right now. It's not like Joe Madison is gonna start eating tonight based off of a letter. We gotta make sure that we get this done. And so the pressure cannot stop. If anything, it needs to intensify. And, and of course, uh, Jeff, what, what you're dealing with here in terms of um, uh, these, in terms of Schumer, um, he also knows that massive protests are being planned around MLK Day. Uh, and he understands uh, that it's going to be happening on that particular day. Uh, and, and the reality is this is why the pressure uh, cannot stop. And frankly, you can't just be so locked in, even in, in backroom dealings. Again, uh, unless unless you move cinema and mansion, uh, it's going to be a vote uh, on uh, that day that uh, look, Lisa Murkowski has said uh, that she supports a, a carve out. And so fine. You're going to have all Republicans except one uh, voting against it. You're going to have all, likely all Democrats except two voting for it. And it still won't get changed. You on mute, Jeff. Sorry about that. Thanks. There I'm you here. Go. Great, great, great. Exceptional to be here with everybody. Happy New Year. I'm speaking progress and purpose in your lives as well, as well as into the life of the Democratic Party. It's what's needed right now. It's uh, it as Dr. Avis pointed out so well, and as Brother Dr. Omikongo said, uh, it's very clear that we've been to this place before. Uh, Chuck Schumer is looking at 
a, a, a daunting task here. You've got to get at least all 50 of the Democrats lined up who are ready to go and make this happen so that we can have a simple majority to pass some of this legislation. The question is, how committed are the Democrats going to be? And how committed are the people going to continue to be to keep this pressure on? All of the groups that you mentioned have done an enormous job of putting this in the national spotlight. But when you talk about making change, it's about commitment. Sort of like being in the red zone in a football game. That comes down to who wants it the most. And this is going to come down to whether Chuck Schumer can actually deliver because that letter still constitutes theory. And a brilliant, a, a proven practice always outweighs a brilliant theory. We've got to see some delivery on that. I think about getting around the filibuster and I think about landmark moments in the filibuster. Uh, you go back to the passing of the landmark 64 Civil Rights Act. You got to take it back to 1957 when you had committed diehard people uh, like Strom Thurmond, who still holds the record, I believe, for a filibuster to this day at, at 24 hours and 18 minutes who was willing to go all in for what he believed in, in terms of blocking our rights. So we have to now see that the Democratic Party is going to go all in and deliver something tangible that they've been promising for a long time. You know, but, uh, the, th the thing here that, that we have to understand uh, is that, um, look, elections do have consequences. And you, you've got, you know, Republicans who, who are sort of, uh, making all of their threats, things along those lines. I saw a tweet earlier uh, from uh, conservative Eric Erickson saying, uh, oh, uh, you know, um, we can certainly, uh, you know, Democrats, they get rid of the filibuster. We can pass uh, all of these uh, different things as well. And one of the things that I say it is, and you can get them vetoed. <laughs> right. <laughs> and 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 and, 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 you, you, one, one, and I did reply, reply to say, Eric, matter of fact, uh, Matter of fact, let me just do this here. I'm uh, I want to blow this up. Hold on one second. Uh, I wasn't going to show this tweet, but let me go ahead and show it. Uh, let, give me just one second here. You know, and, and this is the thing why people why people can't be afraid because uh, I mean, look, you got to do you got to do what you got to do. You always hear election of consequences. Uh, this was the tweet that he sent out. Uh, national constitutional carry, fetal heartbeat law, major tax reform easier access to suppressors, gutting Obamacare, killing the uh, CFPB. Uh, uh, the GOP can do a lot of things too without the filibuster. And I said, yeah, but guess what? Them, those damn things can get vetoed. Mm. And the reality is you need two thirds to overcome a veto, uh, Avis. And so uh, have at it. Even, even if Republicans take over the House and the Senate next year, they can pass all of these things, Avis. Uh, and all Joe Biden has to do is veto the damn things and they won't go anywhere. But the bottom line is this here. On the Democratic side, if you don't pass voting legislation, you better sit here and get your ass mollywhopped because <laughs> they are setting this thing up to guarantee victories for the next decade. Absolutely. That's exactly what they're doing. And I'm laughing at that tweet because included <laughs> that laundry list of stuff that you're exactly right would, would get vetoed in like 2.9 seconds uh, is this idea of gutting the public care when they had the presidency, they couldn't do that. So you know, <laughs> shut the hell up. You ain't fooling nobody. You know, but but this is this is this is just this is exactly why you're you're right. We have the power. We won. We need to act like it because the the Republicans know how to bluster. They know how to talk a good game. Mm -hmm. The reality is that when they are in power, they do whatever the hell they want, mm -hmm. right? And then when, when the Democrats are in power, they try to threaten them. Well, if you do that, we're going to do this. Guess what? They're going to do whatever they want to do when they do have control of every realm of power uh, that they can. And with this particular uh, issue right now, as you've mentioned, with what's happened all over this nation, this is do or die, period. Not only for today, not only for tomorrow, but literally for generations. And, and also, let me remind people of Congo. Uh, that it was Senator Mitch McConnell hmm. who who ignored the filibuster and put two Supreme Court justices on the Supreme Court lifetime appointments without a 60 vote threshold. That's right. And that's so, they made, so they made an exception and did it yep. nine Surely. days before the election. Surely. Yep. 
after saying that Merrick Garland's election uh, nomination was going to happen too close to an election. With, they, they're, they're full of lies, not to mention all of the carve-outs that they've done for, for the budget, which, they, oh, what, over 150 times or something to that extent? Look, this is what they do. When they're in power, they do whatever they want. So we got Eric Erickson's tweet there, but they've always been acting as if the filibuster meant nothing to them when it means controlling the, their own agenda. And let's be mindful of the fact that all of these hundreds of bills that are being passed across uh, these states are happening in these state centers that don't have a filibuster and they're being passed by a simple majority. If it's good for the state level, it's good for the federal level. So look, really at the end of the day, these Democrats need to get online. Mitch McConnell and these Republicans, Romney, all of these guys. I mean, look, they are just full of garbage and they will do anything to protect power and they are simply making it easier for Trump to come back into office. Nothing Senator McConnell says needs to be paid attention to by anybody who says, oh, when they get in power, they're just going to do the same thing. Like you said, Roland, they've already been doing it. And the hypocrisy is glaring. And every single day they say, well, wait till we get it back in power. We saw what you did when you were in power. So we don't got to wait for it to happen later. You have clearly shown that you only care about the filibuster when it works, when, when you're not in full power. And that's when we have to call them on their bluff and move forward. They do not care. They have no concerns, no fear about breaking any institution. And look, the filibuster is not in the Constitution. So at the end of the day, we need to make sure that it's broken. Schumer needs to move expeditiously, expeditiously on this so we can make sure our voting rights are secure before we lose it all, like you said, for a decade or more. Uh, then, Jeff, you got idiots like Sean Spicer, who is former White House spokesman for Donald Trump, uh, who was fired because he didn't know how to wear properly fitted suits. Uh, and he wasn't lying enough. Uh, and so this is what, uh, this right here is what Sean Spicer uh, had, to say, had to say today on Twitter. Uh, he said, reminder, despite lies by left-wing media types like Ryan Lizza, the right to vote in America is not under attack. Every American can vote in person or absentee every vote. Then I tweeted, I said, well, Sean, why are you so scared to have people who believe, who believe in voter suppression on your show. I said, you don't have the guts to actually put them on your show. I said, so uh, that's really part of your problem. So I said, you know, uh, I said, cause you don't want your Newsmax audience to actually know what the truth is, Sean, and he won't do it. And you're not gonna see people uh, on Newsmax uh, who can counter the lie from him because uh, th th that's the lie they wanna keep promoting. We know what these bills do. We know how they make it harder to vote. Man, they don't want the truth to actually be known. And these laws being changed also negatively impact white people. This is not just a black thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We know how they impact Native Americans uh, in uh, critical states, uh, Latinos, African Americans, but they also impact young white progressive voters as well. I think you're absolutely right. I think um, we've got to now contextualize the issue for the long game. We've been thinking about the short game and getting an administration in place uh, and getting four years here or a two term, a two year term in in the Congress in place. But we're not thinking long term. And I say we imaginatively with the Democratic Party saying, how can we look at where we're going to be in 20 years? Because I tell you what, the Republican Party has done it. They have been doing it. They have been working on state legislatures over the last 20 years, securing the right to gerrymander, uh, changing districts, voting, uh, voter suppression is hot and high. And this space here is where the ground, this is ground zero for the battle. And it's a comprehensive, a comprehensive battle. I say that because a lot of the creative space that we burn up here is burnt on rebutting people, shaming people, and pointing out the hypocrisy of people, as we should, who will not listen to rebuttals, who have absolutely no shame, and who don't care that they're hypocritical. So they get criticism, and they don't care because they're laser focused. You got a cat like Mitch McConnell. Oh, he's an awesome example of an old antebellum gentleman that sat on the front porch and picked his teeth while people were out there in the fields working all day. He looks people squarely in the eye. He told the whole world, I am 100 percent focused on stopping Joe Biden's administration. He told us exactly what the agenda is. The question is, and the question, it goes back to what both Dr. Avis and brother Dr. Omitongo just said. 
we've got to really now step it up because lies are the dominant order of the day and the Republican Party doesn't care because they are operating with the philosophy that if you lie enough consistently, people will believe them and people who are supporting the Republican Party and their current agenda to not only block things that will help people in general, even themselves, when you talk about poor and rural whites, when you're talking about that philosophy, you've got to continue to lay on the work that are being done by grassroots organizations and most importantly, the hierarchy of the party because something's gonna have to change if we're gonna combat people who have no shame, who have no guilt, but who are also laser focused on message with one goal and one agenda, and that is to dominate and suppress everybody else. See, the thing that I don't understand uh, is, and again, th 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 it's called Civics 101. There are mm -hmm. three branches of government, okay? Uh, you have federal, executive, and judicial. Mm -hmm. Now, if you, so, what Eric Erickson said, Republicans, oh yeah, you get rid of filibuster, we're gonna do this, 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 this. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, here's what we know. They changed the rules to get yes. two hardcore conservatives on the Supreme Court, stole one of the seats from President Barack Obama, who frankly was not aggressive enough. He should have appointed a black woman to the seat and mm -hmm. really set up uh, a protagonist, antagonist thing here mm -hmm. by having all these old white men say no to the first black woman ever appointed to the Supreme Court. But I digress. <laughs> but, but here's the whole deal here. As I said earlier, okay, Republicans, y'all can take control of the House and the Senate, but we got the White House. So if you Democrats, you focus on controlling one of the three. You either control the House, the Senate, or the White House, and guess what? Whatever they do doesn't matter. They can have a Republican president, a Republican House, but if you control the Senate, no bills get passed. Look what happened when Democrats control uh, the, the House. What, three, 400 bills got passed? Mitch McConnell said, I'm not bringing up any of those. And mm -hmm. so I don't understand what the fear is. And so, yes, is it possible? Is it possible the Republicans could have all three uh, uh, branches, the House, I'm sorry, they can have the House and the Senate, and the White House, and also if you do that, you do control the, the uh, federal bench with your appointments, but that's why elections matter. That's why you get your ass out there and you motiva motivate your base and you hit the ground. That's why you spend the resources. But I'm sorry, I come from, and I'm, I'm straight up about power. Mm -hmm. I'm about power. Either you use the power or you don't. I, rem I remember watching, uh, I remember watching um, uh, the movie Ford versus Ferrari and this guy came into uh, the garage and he was complaining about his sports car. And the uh, 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 Christian Bale, who played, I forgot, the, I forgot the the driver who he played, but he said, "The problem with your car ain't the car is you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, in order for your sports car to work, you got to drive it like a sports car." <laughs> he said, "It ain't a Buick." <laughs> <laughs> and so, so the point is, uh, ask anybody who owns a, a Ferrari or a Dodge Viper or whatever, it can't sit in the garage and you not drive it and rev the engines. Democrats, True. learn to rev the engines. That's, that's right. the whole, that's the point I'm saying. When you got power, you use power. Because when you don't have power, it's guaranteed you can't use it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's right. Yes, sir. One of the things that you pointed out, Roland, if I can jump in here, uh, you used a, a movie about racing. The great Mario Andretti, who is probably considered one of the, the, the greatest racers of all time, said something that I always remember. He said, anytime you reach a point where you say everything is under control, you're not going fast enough. So when we get these letters from Schumer and we say, hey, we're going to get this. It's going to work out. Uh, we got this. We're going to do that. That to me sounds like, oh, we got this under control, but we're not moving and we're not moving fast enough. We're not only not moving and revving the engines, but we're not getting in the race and gunning it to the floor. Anytime you have you run into that wonderful nexus where you have the House, you have the Senate and balance in the Senate and the administration, I guarantee you if it were on the if the shoe were on the other foot, there would be so much legislation rammed through in, in a small amount of time that there would be nearly a revolution the next time there was a midterm election. So 
that's what happens when you have control and if we have truly good legislation that we know is going to benefit people and we know we have an opportunity to push it through you've got to actually make that rubber meet that road right now all right folks hold tight one second gotta, gotta go to a break we come back we're going to talk about uh the increasing approval numbers of vice president kamala harris what happened to all of those stories how awful she was at politico where where you're now story saying her numbers are up. Mm. We'll discuss that. Also, that white judge in Louisiana caught on video uh, using the N-word. And remember, she said she took a pill and just just calls her to s- just say the N-word. I, I don't know. I was. Sorry, folks. All right, looks like I was muted there. Uh, We good? Let's go to break. The video looks phenomenal. See, this is the difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? Yo, it's your man Deion Cole from Blackish, and you watch Roland Martin Unfiltered. Stay woke. All right, folks, welcome back to Roland Martin uh, Unfiltered. Uh, there's a uh, one of the huge issue that uh, often does not get talked about, and that is uh, what is happening with uh, black women and infertility. We've often talked about the issue of fibroids on this show, but this but this is also one of the issues that's going to be addressed in an upcoming documentary by OWN. It is called uh, Eggs Over Easy. This is starting the we're dealing with the questions of infertility among African American women, uh, and, and and it's not just infertility, as I said fibroids, but also we've talked about uh, the difficulty that black women have had even uh, when having children. So joining us right now is the producer and director, executive producer and director uh, of the documentary, uh, Shaquita uh, Lockley, also Keisha Knight, and narrator of Eggs Over Easy, uh, and also uh, the founder of the DetoxNow.com, uh, Coach uh, Jesse Thompson. Glad to have all three of you here. Uh, th- this is something that uh, is, uh, Jesse, we've, we've had you on before talking about this that doesn't get lots of play. Recently, Vice President Kamala Harris uh, had uh, had a, uh, a White House conference dealing with the issue of mortality, black, uh, uh, black mortality. Uh, and uh, again, it, it's amazing how all these pro-life folks are real quiet when it comes to the health uh, of black women. 
it's um, the White House Day of Action really was monumental. And, um, you know, when it comes to this story, I thank you again, Roland, because you always create this platform for us. From my very first time having this story, sharing my story of infertility with you to the miracle babies that came along the way. If we didn't have someone like you to help us share the story, it would be muted. Um, but I am so happy that because the revolution that Dr. Carr talked about is happening because of us amongst in our own and our communities and people like Shaquita and people like Keisha Knight Pulliam and others who um, who really centered this conversation. And, you know, shout out to Shaquita, who's been working on this documentary for a long time and who did not give up on making sure that these stories were amplified because it's not enough for us to um, to have these conversations in silos, it needs to be centered on a national platform and also for us to be educated about those things that are available to us, whether it be integrative, whether it be IVF, whether it be um, holistic, you know, whether it be support and th therapy, as well as egg freezing, all the resources that we need to actually have healthy miracle babies and not be in the situation where the mortality and morbidity crisis is at the alarming rates it's at right now. Shaquita, there were folks uh, who were on social media mocking the uh, title of this documentary. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, wh why was his name chosen? Um, so if you in our culture, we often say um, if a woman is older, her eggs are boiled eggs or scrambled eggs. And I was I happen to be well, it's twofold. So I happen to be watching The Real Housewives of Atlanta and one of the cast members. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm out. sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I, I, <laughs> no hate on the city. You, you will never um, see a housewife. No hating. Over no here, shame. I mean, it's been a while. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. But swung that out, and I, I was like viscerally affected because how are you going to tell this woman, oh, you have scrambled eggs because you're old, and I think she was like maybe forty, um, and so that kind of stuck in the back of my head. Like, why is this such a tough conversation? Why do you always have to say, oh, if you're over thirty-five, something is wrong? Um, so there was that. And then there was my own personal situation going to my gynecologist and I go every year for an annual. Um, and she finally says, hey, you're you're turning 42. Your eggs are turning 42. What do you want to do with them? And so that just made me like spiral and try to figure out what is she even talking about? Well, do what with them? Do I have any? Because I am 42. And so I just kind of thought, OK, how do we make this an easier conversation? If everybody's talking about it, it won't be such a hard um, topic anymore. And so in sitting with it, that's what I felt God gave to me. Eggs over easy. And it's picked up traction. It's doing pretty well. So I did see <laughs> commentary on um, Twitter. But, you know, if people don't want to give the, give the film a shot and actually look at it and take the lessons from it and make sure if you are Gen X and you know your season may or may not have passed or not something you're interested in, tell your little sisters, um, tell your mentees because nobody is telling us about AMH, anti-malaria hormone which lets you know, well it's one of the indicators of whether or not you even have an egg reserve. Nobody's talking about that. So maybe instead of spending so much time and energy um, on the title watch it and then take notes um, because I've done the research so you don't have to go do the research on your little Twitter um, and then pass along these lessons so that the people who are coming behind us don't have to wake up at 30 or wake up at 40 trying to figure out a procedure that's the cost of a car when most of our parents can't help us pay for this. So we need a better plan. Felicia Fant is one of the executive producers on the documentary. And she says, plan for your body the way you plan for your career. So I went to Spelman, Keisha went to Spelman. Um, that's a women's college. It's the number one HBCU, by the way. So <laughs> if we aren't, if like if we aren't talking about it, if we don't know um, these answers, then most people probably aren't talking about it and most people probably don't know these answers. So what I hope to do with the film and what our intention is, even with the title, <laughs> um, is to spark that conversation and, and, and make sure that your 25 year old niece doesn't have to deal with what our generation kind of had to deal with. And well, I, Roland, well, I, thank well, you I, for having this conversation. Well, I, well, I am, uh, as often, I often wear different HBCU attire and wear St. Augustine's University uh, hoodie today, so uh, they might disagree with your assessment, the number one HBCU. Uh, <laughs> I mean, Keisha, Keisha, let me, uh, Keisha, let, let, me, let me go to you. Why was it important? Uh, why did you want to be involved in this project? 
you know, it was really important to me for a variety of reasons. The funny thing is, is that we started this so long ago, um, right after my daughter Ella was born. So she was born and she's almost five. And really it started out as just me supporting someone that I love, Shaquita and, and Felicia. But what I knew was that this was a really important story to be told because we don't have this authentic, transparent conversation around all things that have to do with our reproductive, our reproductive system, whether it's if you want to have a baby, if you don't want to have a baby, you know, what your fertility looks like. Have you had miscarriages along the way? Like these are such subjects that come with so much misinformation and so much shame that one of the things that are really important to me and what I do is ensuring that I use my platform to, to for good, use my platform to, to put information out there specifically for black women, because I am a black woman and I am a mother to a little girl who will be a black woman. So it was a no brainer when you know, Shaquita first approached me about this. I was like, okay, special. So outside of um, having gone to Spelman, we're both Delta. She's my special. So, um, you know, I had a little bit of obligation because she was like, special, I need something. I was like, what do you need? <laughs> okay, <laughs> is how it started. But she knows that there's nothing that I wouldn't do for her. And it was my honor um, to not only narrate this film, but also become an executive producer and even share my story. Um, you know, like, like Shaquita and, and everyone has already said, we, we're, we're taught about our career. We're taught about, you know, it, it's kind of crazy. You spend your first half for your life trying not to get pregnant. And then the second half trying to, and never does it occur to you that it may not happen as easily as you think it will. Um, so it was important me, for me to also share my journey and, um, you know, where I stand, because the other piece is you can be in a place in your career where you say, you know what, I know I want children, but I know I don't want them today. So what does that look like? And I think the biggest thing is making sure that women feel empowered, that whatever your decision is, whether it's to have children, to not have children, to wait, to freeze your eggs, whatever that looks like, you know, it's your uterus and your choice. And recently I posted something, because especially in my position, people always want to have um, assumptions about what's going on in your body. And I just had to tell people, like, just back up off my uterus. It's really that simple. Your uterus is no one else's business. Now I want to go to questions from my panel. First up, Avis, what you got? Hello, ladies. Thank you so much for de developing this documentary and really bringing this much needed topic out into the light. Um, my question for you is, you know, what are some of the things that you have found? I know for me specifically, the statistics around um, maternal mortality as it relates to Black women is abs are absolutely shocking. Yeah. Uh, but when it comes to this issue of infertility, do we see a similar level of disparity uh, between Black women and having to struggle with the issue of fertility as compared to other women, and particularly white women? For example, are we more likely, much more likely to struggle with this? Or is the issue that we're much less likely to be able to uh, take um, move forward with the actions that are necessary in order to possibly overcome it? Well, I want to start with something. I think it's twofold. I think that a lot of it is the access, the resource, the resources, and the knowledge around the subject. And that's really, really what we're trying to shed light on, because, yes, there'll be a disparity specifically if the information isn't disseminated to all people. If we aren't receiving the information to make the informed choices, then decisions are made for us. Um, you know, when when we we could have had something different to do and a different input, but we didn't know how. So I'll let, you know, Shaquita chime in with the statistic piece of it. But I think that, you know, that disparity um, is is paramount. Yeah, thank you, Keisha. Um, so if we're just looking at numbers, Black women and Black people in general, you know that we have medical disparities. If you look at 243%, which is the maternal mortality rate, like we're dying about three times more often um, than a white woman. If you look at the cost of having to pay for IVF, even if you have a great job, if we're making 61 to 62 cents on the dollar of a white man, then is it really apples and apples? No, it's not. It's apples and oranges um, because we're not even at the playing field to even have the money to, to go and have these procedures done. So it's, it's both. Um, it's definitely in terms of IVF and how we even find information. Do you have a doctor who looks like you? 
Do you have a doctor who is listening to you? So we have a segment of the film where we just talk about doctors not listening to black women. We could probably do a Google search and get millions of hits. Um, I talk about Serena Williams because she is like famous with a huge audience yeah. and it didn't matter. And none of that mattered because her skin was black and the doctor still didn't listen to her. So yes, to your question. Yeah. Jeff, could, your well, I was yeah, gonna go say, if I could chime in real quick on yeah, that. Go ahead. Role, another go ahead. thing is that black women are disproportionately affected by fibroids, as you know, and fibroids is actually a leading cause of, if not sometimes the cause of um, actual infertility, as it was in my case. So now you have, let's add that layer, all right? So we're disproportionately affected by fibroids. We get them in more number, we get them in larger size, more symptomatic, and that now makes a, a layer of complexity with respect to the infertility um, uh, equation that now, yes, we're disproportionately affected by that. So now we're even more affected by fertil fertility and infertility, if, if I could um, add that. And because of that, because they're, again, we're thrown. So let's add now the hysterectomy piece Mm -hmm. Because most women are black women are the number one recipients of hysterectomies. Absolutely. Okay? Mm -hmm. So now we're getting um, be made infertile by virtue of the fact that that is the number one way of dealing with the issue, which, you know, that is why we advocate and we educate over and over and we help women every day to look at what are their options, what are their integrative options, holistically diet, stress, you know, management as well as um as well as surgeries whatever it is that they need together in order to heal these issues so they're dealing with them at the root if they want to have children as well jeff sure I, first i want to thank you all all of you sisters for the work that you're doing out there jesse for the work that you're doing with the uh, detox now uh keisha for lending your voice to this project and of course shaquita for being bold enough to step out there and deal with a real issue I, I can say personally there's no more humbling experience than actually seeing birth and being there and i've been blessed to be in a room with my wife and the midwives and just to see that first burst of life and to recognize that one thing that we all have in common, no matter what our politics are, no matter where we come from, we come and we have emerged into this world, into these earth suits that we're wearing through the womb of a woman. So there's so much respect that I have there. I also have respect for women who don't call it quits. So when I'm counseling young women and they say, hey, I'm 25, my life is over, I remind them that my own parents met late in life. My mother uh, met my father in her mid thirties. My brother was born at, when she was 37 years old. She was 39 years old when she had me and she was a week shy of her 44th birthday when my sister was born. So my question to you all and the great work that you're doing is, how can we as a community continue to provide hope for women out there who are looking to have children in any possible means and how can we provide hope for them and how can we provide support for them so that we can continue to pass things on generationally? I mean, we're doing it right now. We're doing it right now. We're having these conversations and there are so many women who are watching and they're feeling like I'm not alone. You're feeling like, okay, I have options. I have resources. There are people who are hearing me, who are listening. So I feel like what we're doing now is, is really important in paying it forward and sharing this information, making sure, you know, that when we're, we fought to have this story told and it's coming on own tomorrow at 9 p.m. Eastern <laughs> yes. Standard, you know, Pacific time, that we show up, you know, that we support that we tell a friend, hey, you know, let's let's watch this, let's support this, because what we also know in this business is that it is a business, and, is it about, and it's about what is successful. Mm -hmm. So if we want to continue to have these stories told, then we have to support them. So that's what I would say, you know, share this information, and um, you have to just make sure that you share your stories too as women. Because it's easy to only want to share your highlight reel, but mm -hmm. the truth is in the journey. The truth is in everything that it took you to get there. And that's also where growth and inspiration happen as well. So make sure that you are bold enough to share your journey, not just, you know, with your closest girlfriends, but with all women who could help and who could benefit and be empowered by what you share. Omakongo, your question. First of all, I want to commend all, all three of you for the incredible work that, that you're doing. It, it, it's truly amazing. And 
my question really is, as, as black men, what can we do on, I mean, we talked about, you know, doctors and people who aren't listening and, and we understand that narrative as it relates to the larger community, but in, in our daily lives, what can we do as, as black women to, as black men to support our sisters throughout this experience from, from, from beginning to, to wherever it may take them? If I could jump in here, um, I love that you asked that question, <laughs> doctor. As a woman who battled infertility for 10 years, mm. um, the number one thing, my husband was with me on the journey. Mm. Um, and yeah, that meant that he was not pushing an agenda. If he said, what is it, what's the next decision? As we went from one IVF cycle to another, right? It was, if this is too much on your body, I want this to be, if it's only what you want to do. This is your decision. I'm here to support you. And as I coach women literally all over, I, I, I would love to show this testimony wall that we have if we have it up. But the thing that the other thing I see in the support that we have is that when women go on these journeys, whether it's holistic or intervention or whatever, that you go on it with them, my brother. OK, mm -hmm. so it's everything from um, we have a sister who she couldn't conceive for 12 years. Right. And she was really, in fact, we, the first place we announced this was on your show, Roland. <laughs> oh my God, I got goosebumps. And she and her husband oh. were like, look, we're not giving up. We're not giving up. They actually did our, our detox, our balance program together. And within a month, two months, they actually, it was a month and a half. They actually conceived and now they have two miracle babies. Why? Because he did it with, wow. he didn't say, oh, I'm going to be over here cheering you on. I got mm -hmm. in, he got into the trenches and he did it with her. And the other thing is be fiercely protective of your, of your, your spouse, your woman, where you see other people minding their uterus. I'm, I'm plugging you, Shaquita, your line, eggs over easy has a merch line. And it says, mind your uterus. And you see mm -hmm. whether it's, you know, your family brothers are usually the ones that are in our sister's businesses saying, when you going to have children, when you going to have this? You know what? You need to sometimes step in there and say, you know what? This is a very deeply, deeply personal, intimate um, issue. And really, I really want you to give us some space on this because these mm -hmm. are things that are causing anxiety. They're causing stress. They're causing inflammatory responses in our bodies, causing the very thing that actually will throw off our balance when we're trying, meaning our hormonal balance, where we're trying to conceive, it makes it worse. So be the fierce mm -hmm. protector, right? Mm -hmm. Get in there and actually do it with her. And of course, support. Well, I, I, I'll say Thank this you. here. Uh, look, I, I, I feel you on uh, the stress stuff like that, but uh, sometimes you gotta cuss some people out. <laughs> um, uh, I, I, Mind I your business. I, 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 ain't, I, ain't your I ain't got a problem. Mind I know because I know it was like shortly after Jack and I get my, my got married. One woman kept pressing her about, and I was like, "Look, we good." I was like, "You know, we good, we good." And she was like being all nice about it. And the, and again, I mean, like we're, we're trying to sit here and be cool, you know. And then, and homegirl kept pressing, you know. And I was like, "Okay, she need to buy her own damn business." <laughs> uh, and then and now, so just so y'all know, we were not actually in the sanctuary. We were actually in the foyer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and she and so she kept pressing. I, she kept pressing. The final, I was like, "Yo!" And I was like, "Hey, we fucking, you straight?" <laughs> Homegirl was like, "I was like, stop asking them damn questions." Hey. She didn't ask that question again. And that's uh, that. that was the last wow. time she asked that question. Yeah, I look, look, I, look. I like God. No, I'm gonna cuss somebody out. So I, I don't know why we like faking the funk. Yes, that's exactly what I did uh, at the church about walls. I didn't yes, get. Sir. <laughs> that woman is watching. You know damn well I was serious when I told you that too. All right, uh, it's over easy on all on that PM Eastern uh, tomorrow. Uh, I appreciate it, Jaquita, Jesse, uh, and Keisha. Thanks a lot, good seeing all y'all. Thanks Thank for having you. us. Thanks for all having right, us. All right, folks. Take having. care. That's right. Cuss folks out at church if you need to. Yes, sir. All right, we'll be back. Uh, some breaking news uh, about Congressman Bobby Rush. Uh, who is, uh, we'll tell you about him when we come back on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network.
I'm Amber Stevens West. Yo, what up, y'all? This is Jay Ellis, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. All right, folks, welcome back to Roland Martin Unfiltered. Some breaking news. Congressman Bobby Russ out of Chicago has announced that he is stepping down from Congress after uh, his term is completed. Uh, he joins a number of other uh, Democrats who have announced that they are not going to be seeking uh, re-election. He has had uh, some health issues uh, over uh, the last uh, several years. And so uh, this is certainly going to set off a firestorm of people who are seeking uh, his position. You might remember this. And this was after the death of Trayvon Martin uh, when Congressman Rush uh, ticked off uh, Keenan, go ahead and take that audio. When he ticked off uh, the house, mercy, when he wore a hoodie on the floor. And you humbly with your God. And in the New Testament, Luke 4, 4, 18 to 20, teaches us these words. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good the news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners Never and the recovery of sight to the blind. To set the oppressed free. I urge all who hear these words to heed these lessons. May God the bless the no Martin Martin's recognized. soul, his free family. The member is no longer recognized. The chair will ask the sergeant at arms to enforce the prohibition on the court. Of course, um, and of course, uh, Rush um, is also, he is the only person uh, on the Congo who has ever uh, beaten President Barack Obama in an election. Yes, indeed. And throughout it all, somebody who's been unwavering in his dedication to our community. And, you know, this is somebody who is time well served, right? I mean, for so long, he has been a voice in our community, whether it's through the political world or you know out in, in the community organizer space and really quite honestly when we're seeing so much integrity not being demonstrated right now by by our political leaders and some of these guys who are retiring I, I can't wait for them to be gone but when you look at somebody like him we have to remember that really at the end of the day to do something like that you know out of respect to Trayvon Martin and his family and, and to call attention to this something that he's done his entire career and we need that type of integrity now more than ever because it had, you know, we're still being assaulted, we're still being killed, we're still being slaughtered in the streets. And no matter what people try to draw attention to or in terms of diverging the attention to something else and saying it's not that important, he stood there in front of everybody and made that point and, and has done it on multiple occasions. So I want to commend the brother for everything that he's done to be a role model in our community. And again, it's time will serve. And I hope that his integrity continues to live on in others who have come after him. And uh, don't forget, uh, Jeff, uh, this is a, a former member of the Black Panther Party uh, who later became a member of Congress. Sure. In the 1960s, he was the founder of the Illinois Panther Party. So he's put in the time. He's put in the work. Uh, it's great to hear him in that clip that you show because it shows that eventually you reach an age where you just don't give a crap anymore. You just don't care. You're ready to say what's on your mind. You're not going to let anybody stop you. Uh, Bobby Rush has been a very popular congressman representing that first district of Illinois. Uh, and if you look at the last four elections he's he's had to go through, his average uh, margin of victory was 72, 73%. So it tells you how popular he, he is. I think at 75 years old, there's only so much that we can expect. And one of those things that we can expect is that people can bow out gracefully, that they can become elder statesmen, and that they get to enjoy a little bit of life uh, on this end of this of this side. We expect people to work until they can't work anymore. That's an old Western mindset. I really think that he has achieved that status of esteemed elder. I think now it comes down to how can we best live his legacy by supporting people who are going to get in there and fight like he fought. Uh, Avis. You know, I, I, I completely agree. I just want to carry on that last point about, you know, he deserved to mm -hmm. be able to now enjoy the rest of his life yes. and not deal with the foolishness that's going on right now in Congress. Let's just be real about that. <laughs> But also it is a it is I think it's a great example to show uh, the sort of uh, the changing of the guard, the, the passing along of the baton. I, I'm very proud of him having this leadership throughout his career as a community activist, 
as an elected official, but also leading by example here of not being pushed out because of scandal, not you know just staying there just to hold the seat forever, but making the affirmative choice that now I'm going to move on, I'm going to live the rest of my life, yeah. and someone else is going to have the opportunity to represent uh, my district. I think that's an example that more elected officials, quite frankly, uh, need to take to heart. Uh, and uh, just to remind folks, uh, Congressman Bobby Rush is uh, an ordained minister. Uh, he said it's going to continue his ministry work. Uh, and this this marks, uh, when his term is up, it will mark 30 years in Congress. He was first elected in 1992. Wow. He's 75 years old. And so uh, he is stepping down. And so certainly uh, good luck to him. All right, folks, so let's talk about uh, this latest poll uh, from Reuters. Ips has shown that uh, the approval rating for Vice President Kamala Harris is at 51%. It's kind of interesting, Avis, because we, we, we've been dealing with all year. Oh, my God, how awful she is. Her numbers are the worst for vice president in history. But something else also, I think, has happened over the past uh, few weeks. Uh, you have seen uh, the White House and the vice president's uh, communications team be a lot more aggressive in getting her out there, showing her the things that she's been involved with. Uh, she's done far more interviews as of late. Uh, I wish they do those interviews with black owned media. Trust me, the White House is going to be getting, excuse me, her staff is going to be getting an email for me uh, when the show is over. Uh, but I mean, this is what they should have been doing. She's been doing the work, but you can do the work and nobody know, or you can be doing the work and tell folks what work you're doing. Absolutely. And, and this is mm -hmm. the thing, honestly, it is a problem with this is yet another one of those you know problems that seems to be built into the dna of much of the people in the democratic party mm -hmm. you know very focused on policy very focused on the intricacies and the nuances of getting things through they're very enamored with the policy process but they don't put a lot of emphasis and forethought into quite frankly the public relations that's necessary to let the people know what they're doing. And then when you juxtapose that against the fact that she is a pathbreaker here, that she is the first woman, that she is a black woman doing this job that is gonna get unfair criticism regardless, you need to be especially strategic and aggressive with those PR efforts just to let people know what you're doing and to fight back against the false narratives that get all the attention. So it's good to see that she is in fact moving up in those approval ratings. And I hope they see the connection between getting her out there more and those approval ratings going up so that they do even more of those things that we see are working. Uh, but the thing that also, um, like here, here's a poll here that that's, that's just strange on Macongo. When you look at it, the poll was taken uh, December 13th to the 17th. And here's what's crazy. More than half of Americans, 56% believe the national economy and the country generally is headed in the wrong direction. But the numbers don't support that when you look at what's going on. Uh, Republican, and that's driven because 81% Republicans think that. 59% uh, uh, of uh, independents uh, think that. But I'm sorry, if you look at the economic numbers, you look at the job numbers, look at uh, uh, GDP, you look at all of those different things, uh, they are going positive. That's called you're not selling yourself properly. You're not telling your story. You're not controlling your narrative. You are allowing uh, the notion of dysfunction to drive the narrative. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and we have to be clear, like you said, all these economic indicators, Biden has surpassed Trump at every juncture for this time during their presidencies. And yet you have people like retiring Pat Toomey saying that, you know, under Trump, we had the best economic uh, time of, of, of my uh, adulthood or whatever. You know, they keep making up these these lies and these stories, but that's because Trump was out there every single day talking about how it's the best economy ever and no one's ever seen anything like this. And Biden doesn't do enough bragging. As, you know, he can't just get out there and just completely pat himself on the back like there's no problems because of course there are, but he needs to point out these numbers. And Vice President Harris, who's a better communicator than, than President Biden is, needs to get out there and do the same thing. Look, the fact of the matter is, Roland, I'm pretty sure for the rest of the week, I am not going to see other news outlets report on Vice President Harris's positive approval rating because it's not in their best interest. And so what I'm <laughs> hoping is that after you send that email to, to Vice President Harris and her team, they realize that with all of the, the ask, 
the, the, the aspects of media that, that you're dominating and, and other networks that are out there. She needs to get out there and with black media. And like you said, specifically black owned media, she has an open invitation. So why would you not get out there and, and speak? Why would you not get out there and, you know, didn't Biden put you in charge of uh, the voting rights stuff? Get out there and speak on it. No, no statements, you know, on Twitter, so on and so forth. You are a powerful communicator. You always have been. And it is clear that there are so many of us who are willing to get out there and uplift you and who are out there defending you every single day. Get out there and give us more stuff to talk about because we know what you're doing, but you got to let the world know too and silence those haters. We know a lot of haters are going to hate anyway, but just get out there and speak the facts so we can get out there and, and buttress those facts with you as well. Uh, again, if you, if you don't tell your story, Jeff, somebody else will. Oh, of course, especially when you talk about politics. But it's the same with creativity and the arts. It's the same with media. If you don't tell people, somebody is going to stand up and they're going to stand up strong and they're going to stand up long and they're going to make sure that they sing your song for you. So when we talk about how do we get this out here, you think about the concept of shaming versus gaming. So I think when you talk about Democrats, we spend a lot of time shaming when the Republicans are spending a lot of time gaming and they recognize something very, very powerful about the psyche of the American people. And that is that perception is as real as reality. As long as you continue to drive the same message home, we have long seen the myth of meritocracy in America destroyed. We know that you can be mediocre and just have somebody who was a roommate with somebody's grandmother and you're going to get a job if your skin is white in America. You know, you work really, really hard and you don't have that same connection when you're black. Things are different, even if you have a ton of degrees. So we have to get to the point where, as you said, as everyone has said, to echo what everyone has said, we're absolutely right. It, it it seems as if we should be invited in or the White House staff should just tune in to RMU every night and listen to us and watch the, the chat screen and you would solve 90% of America's problems with just plain common sense. But when you talk about how to get this message out here, you've got to make sure that you put people in a space where they can experience the authenticity. And one thing that you can say about Republicans and you can say that about conservatives, you can say that about people who whatever party they have, as we find ourselves at the at the at the crossroads where we really might see the possibility of white minority rule emerge tremendously in America, we got to start looking at how strongly they're putting out that message. And that message is an authentic message. We don't care about you. We want to preserve America. We want to make America great again. We want to make it so that we are on the on the Wheaties boxes and everybody else has a towel over their arm. We're going to say that honestly and boldly. And guess what? They're being authentic about that. And people are responding to that authenticity. On the other hand, we've got an accomplished person like Vice President Harris, who is out there getting getting taken down it with words and images by people who are laser focused on tearing her down so the white house has to respond has to turn around and the number one space you've got to do that is at home we talk about that on this show all the time we say bring your eyeballs home this is the space where you should be having a conversation directly with some of the greatest minds that has been, have been assembled on this network so that we can concentrically take that message out to let people know i don't care what you've seen and what you've been uh convinced to believe here is the absolute truth and we're going to rock the world with this uh absolutely uh all right folks uh mm -hmm. we are uh, awaiting uh, more breaking news. Uh, a jury has reached a decision in the trial of that fraudster, Elizabeth Holmes, uh, you know, the company uh, Thanos, where they had this so-called magical blood test that actually never even existed. Uh, so uh, we're waiting to see uh, what that decision is. Actually, uh, she's been found guilty on four counts of fraud and conspiracy at her former blood testing startup, Theranos. Uh, and so again, wow. uh, count, uh, found guilty on four counts uh, of criminal charges in, in her federal fraud case. Uh, again, that decision, that jury decision is being read as we speak. Uh, and uh, let's see here. Let me just see if there's any more information here. Um, let's see here. Again, it was, it was financial fraud going on. And so we're waiting to hear more. Again, the decisions are being read 
uh, like literally as, 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 as we speak. Uh, but Elizabeth Holmes found guilty for four counts. All right, folks, let's talk about uh, the story out of Louisiana. Remember we told you about uh, that judge in Louisiana uh, who uh, was busted on video, her own home video uh, using the N word. Uh, roll, roll the video, please. Y'all have it? Oh, oh shit! shit. Mom goes, why are the lights when, here? When I pull up in the whip, they be saying, "God damn!" Why are your lights on? They're like, pull up, pull up. And mom's yelling, "Nigger, nigger!" Oh, Henry, have a nigger. It's a nigger, like a roach. Look, I'm, oh, that's me. No, that's I came no, from that's the backside. Awesome. And look, he trips over the lights. <laughs> <laughs> he trips twice. He trips twice. <laughs> I was the only one running. That's me. Ken, Kenny was standing. I'm the one that took him down. Kenny's just standing there. Uh-huh. He lied. That was his wallet. Yeah. That's my phone where it fell out. Look, Mom. The dude had a phone on him. You should have taken his phone and stolen from him, that fucking asshole. And now I'm going to have a gun. It's important. Very important. As me and Austin maintain control of this situation. The great thing is, is we've got video. We've got Laughing at city court judge Michelle Odinette says she takes full responsibility for her hurtful words. Now remember, uh, she first said she took a pill and I just don't recall any of those things. I don't know what was being said. But yeah, you sounded like you were out of it. Uh, she's now uh, out of a job. Uh, and of course, they replaced her with a, with a black judge. Uh, and, and I just keep I just keep saying, uh, Avis, uh, look, this this nice little device right here is just going to let all the races reveal themselves right here. Sure does. I mean, but you know what's what's really interesting? I just want to know who leaked the video because yeah, <laughs> right, right. I don't want to know who the hell is <laughs> that's the real thing we need to figure out. But <laughs> the reality is here though that we got to look inside the um, sort of the quiet conversations that are had, not in public view. And the sad situation is, we know people are like this all over the place, but as a judge, you know, what sorts of things are going through her mind when she sees black people in front of her? And this is why it was important for her to resign, because how could she move forward in credibility and say that she is an impartial judge even when she's in her home using this, that's where she feels the most comfortable. So you know she's saying what she really thinks. But once again, it makes me wonder who the hell she piss off. Or somebody leaked mm -hmm. that. Yeah, and, and you're right. I mean, and, and that's the thing. What this reveals, Omakongo, is what's going through your mind. That determines how you your your judicial rulings. Absolutely. And look, I, I, I'm not a lawyer, but I, I've watched enough Law and Order episodes, you know, to know that <laughs> when you get exposed in, in ways like this. All of your past stuff's got to get reviewed too. I mean, people need to be looking at this woman's record to see what patterns of bias have existed in her cases. Because really, at the end of the day, it's not just enough for her to resign. If there, there needs to be some other types of consequences, being disrobed or, or something. You can't do something that egregious, as Dr. Amos was saying, as a judge and just walk away. It's not like you're just working at like CVS and somebody says something to you at the cash register and you start cursing them out. You are a judge who takes an oath to be impartial and all of that and it clearly shows that you are a racist so there needs to be a deeper investigation into her, her, her past cases to see where biases are and to be quite honest she should face penalties in terms of being disrobed and not have the opportunity to practice in any way shape or form because I don't know how it works with judges but we see it with enough police officers who do something racist be, or do something extremely inappropriate and they resign and then they go right down the street and work somewhere else and she's going to move to another county and, and be a judge there as well she, that shouldn't be allowed and I'm just glad that whoever she pissed off let the world know who she really is. So thank you. Jeff is all about, uh, again, um, snatching that law license. That's the key. Well, that's the big key. It, and I, I double, triple down on what Dr. Avis and Brother Omicongo said. You also need to check your friend circle because baby girl, somebody ratted you out badly. <laughs> they, you must have done, I don't know what you did, but they put you out there. Uh, I'm, I'm also, I'm kind of glad when I see incidents like this happen. Um, Ice Cube had an album death certificate and one of the songs begins with here's what they think about you. Here's what they think about you. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's good to know uh, what people think. 
uh, and it's good to catch them in spaces where they feel comfortable saying something to the credit of the person who shared they may very well be not to presume too much but they may be very well one of the white allies that we talk about uh, and we talk about hey what can we do behind closed doors and one of the things that the late Dr. Francis Cress Wilson used to say is that if you're white and you want to help make a change you've got to tell black people and other people what is said in the room when there are no other black people there so if you're in there you got to do that so this may very well be a case of that we also have to see what the real long-term consequence is going to be it was brought up that you got to review her caseload you got to look at her decisions you got to see how race and sentencing could have been a, a very well a factor it's got to hurt her in her pocketbook at some point uh, she's embarrassed she's frustrated she's used all of these terms but she actually did it nobody takes a pill that makes them do something <laughs> that <laughs> egregious uh, and that is that is I'm just saying I hadn't seen a pill like that I've seen a pill to make you sleepy I've seen pills that make you honest I've, I've counseled people through situations where they had a little bit too much to drink and they said what was really on their mind because their prefrontal cortex had shut down but the reality is that's a powerful pill that's a pill called white supremacy and there must be some secret underground where that thing is being manufactured and dropped in drink with 200 million people at a time. I don't know what it is. Uh, the, the other thing that could happen is, I think about a year ago, uh, there was a country singer named Morgan Wallen. And this issue happened here out of Nashville. He got caught on a security camera using the word he was drunk and he was just going in. He got caught. His The consequence for him was he had to apologize. He did an Instagram video. Uh, the record label did not fully drop him. They suspended him at the time. Uh, country radio stopped playing all of his tunes. Uh, and the, and he there was a talk about giving $100,000, I think, to the NAACP. But uh, guess that, what that, happened? Yeah, there were like eight groups he was supposed to give money to. I think that, that was only gave one, I think. He only gave one, right? So, so we see this, but look at the other side. This wouldn't have hurt him because because he was punished, his fans responded. So his digital album sales went up 1,220% and his album sales went 3, 327% in an increase just because of the incident. He had to get online and tell his fans to stop defending him. So th this tells you about when we talk about that term, we use that term, your vibe attracts your tribe. What do you do with the fallout that comes from other people who say, I'm just going to make sure when I'm put, before I put on my robe that I'm going to check my squad to make sure nobody's recording this before I say what I truly say before I go feel before I go into that classroom. Well, she gone. <laughs> Right. Hey, Roland, you could do some diversity training with her, brother. She nah, one on one. Nah, <laughs> hell no. Nah. She need to visit from hashtag. Team. She need to visit from hashtag team with that ass. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. All right, y'all. Gotta go. Uh, I gotta go to a break. I'll be back on Roland Martin Unfiltered. It's time to be smart. When we control our institutions, we win. We, win, we win. This is the most important news show on television of any racial background. Y'all put two, three, four, five, 10, 15, 20, 30 dollars on this and keep this going. What you've done, Roland, since this crisis came out in full bloom. Anybody watching this, tell your friends. 
Go back and look at the last two weeks, especially of Roland Martin and Filch. I mean, hell, go back and look at the last two days. You've had sitting United States senators today, Klobuchar and Harris. Whatever you have that you have, you can bring to Roland Martin unfiltered to support it. Please do, because this information may literally save your life. Watch Roland Martin unfiltered daily at 6 p.m. Eastern on YouTube, Facebook, or Periscope, or go to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Support the Roland Martin Unfiltered Daily Digital Show by going to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans distributing 50 bucks each for the whole year. You can make this possible. RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Stevens West. Yo, what up, y'all? This is Jay Ellis, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. All right, folks, after a month long investigation, uh, Virginia's Attorney General is suing a Virginia town for discriminatory practices that have taken place involving the town's law enforcement. Attorney General Mark Herring says Windsor's police department operated in a way that led to discrimination against African-Americans violating their constitutional rights. The probe was prompted by a December 2020 traffic stop involving two Windsor Police Department officers and Caron Nazario, an Army lieutenant who is black and Latino. Two Windsor cops pulled him over, pepper sprayed him, and pointed their guns at the military officer. One of those officers did get fired for violating department policies. Uh, guys, if y'all have that video, uh, go ahead and roll it, please. Uh, we remember when this happened. It was a uh, shocking. Uh, Let me see your hands. How many occupants are in the vehicle? What's going on? How many occupants are in your vehicle? It's only myself. Why are your weapons drawn? What's going on? Open the door slowly and step out. Open the door. I'm not getting out the vehicle. What's going on? Get out the car. Open the door slowly and get out. What's going on? Get out the car. Now. Open the door and get out the car. Hold, 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 hold. Keep your hands outside the window. Keep your hands outside the window. My hands are right here. What's going on? Get out of the car now. Get out of the car. What's now. going on? Get out of the car now. Get out of the car now. I'm serving this country and this is how I'm treated. Yo, what, guess what? I'm a veteran too. I'm going to obey. That's Get not... out of the car. What's going on? Get out of the car now. What's going on? What's going on? You're fixing to ride the lightning, son. I'm sorry, what? Get out of the car now. What's going on? Get out on? of the car now. Get out of the car. Sir, just get out of the car. Work with us and we'll talk to you. Get out the car. You received an order. Obey it. I'm I'm af I'm honestly afraid to get out. Can I yeah, you, actually you what's be. going on? Get out. What's get going out. on? What get did I do? Car. Get out now. I have not committed any crimes. You're being stopped for a traffic violation. You're not cooperating at this point right now. You're under arrest. For a traffic. You're being detained, okay? You're being detained for, for a traffic justice. violation. I do not have to get out the vehicle. You haven't even told really? me why I'm being stopped. Really? Get your get hands off. Get out of the car now. Get out of the car. Get your hands off me, get please. Of get your hands off me. You know what? Get your hands off me. Get your hands off me. I didn't do anything. 
Don't do that. Sir, get out of the car Don't do now. that. Hey, Don't do that. Sir, Don't do. Look, I'm trying to talk to you. Okay. I'm trying to I'm talk to you. Just get out of the car. Can you please relax? Can you please relax? Get out of the car right I'm, now. Now, now y'all yeah, remember that was the video the that uh, that he was recording from his car. This was the video uh, that came from one of the body cameras uh, as well, uh, and, and you see Get them the approaching the car. Uh, this, the car I remember, this was crazy when, when this first Get happened, the Davis. Uh, and the, uh, the action should be taken against them the by the you attorney general uh, because. Uh, you know, what they did was unbelievable. And again, the guy was like, this, he was getting conflicting information. Uh, 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 show us your hands, but then open the door. He was like, what? I, I can't do all y'all keep saying. Uh, and, but this is the stuff that uh, we talk about all the time, but these departments need to be held accountable. They certainly do. And the thing that really strikes me is that get your hands off me throughout that entire and, you know, it's very interesting here that the only people that get out of the car now. I'm trying to get out. Okay, I'm trying to I'm talk get out. Still have to train how to de-escalate situations. Mm -hmm. He was the only one who remained calm and in control of himself and was well communicative throughout the entire event. You know, that a whole level of just plain, I don't even know, just the maturity that those officers were incapable of. So absolutely, I'm hoping that everything is thrown uh, at this town in terms of suing the town and figuring out what else can be done to make sure that not only those officers uh, you know, pay the price, and I believe that they've been fired, at least one, as, as I recall. It's been a while since I've seen that in the, in, the, uh, in the news. But what are they doing now to make sure that those types of altercations aren't, uh, you know, repeated in the future. Because if you don't change whatever is going on in terms of their recruitment and their training, it's not just training. You can't make, you know, diamonds out of stuff that's, you know, ooh, you know, so they have to make sure that they are recruiting the right type of person to give that type of power to. And then at the same time, they need to make sure that they're training them correctly. Because I am not sure that that same thing wouldn't happen again. Why wouldn't we think it would happen? It wouldn't happen again. Uh, talk, talk about just absolutely uh, crazy. Uh, you know when you when you see that, and on Congo, this also goes to show why a George Floyd Justice Act is so important to get it passed yep. by Congress. Absolutely, and this is also something that Vice President Harris can be out there speaking about, right? Because we need to have mm -hmm. that legislation passed as well. One of the other things I remember about this case is that they tried to pull him over on a dark road, and he was the mm. one who drove to that gas station. So that he can have better lighting and imagine if he didn't do that i know that if i was in a situation like well i've been in situations like that but you know i'm sitting here saying to myself when i'm watching the video and they're saying open the door and at the same time keep your hands out where we can see mm -hmm. them imagine yeah. if he had turned to take off that seat belt mm. and what they were waiting to light him up they were waiting to light no him no up. no they, they, actually, they actually said it yeah you, you, you're gonna uh feel the lightning feel the lightning yeah. Yeah, exactly. So they were looking for any reason. And like Dr. Davis said, we have to be the ones to defuse these situations. And this ties into our last segment with the judge. Like we said, where are those officers now? You know, the one that got fired, the other one who may have got disciplined in some way, shape or form. So, yeah, it's great that the, the attorney general has filed this lawsuit. We need to see some real consequences, some real financial consequences. We need to see some people really lose their job and not be able to go down the street and get hired again. And like you said, Roland Martin, if we had that George Floyd Policing Act, there would be a registry so these guys can't just hop from county to county and do the same thing to us. Uh, yeah. Yeah, sure. Uh, first off, I always try to tell people, my kids ask me, what am I afraid of? I, I usually just say I'm afraid of underachievement or I'm afraid of not doing the best that I could do in life at, instead of circumstances and situations. But when I hear that tape and those words come into my ears, uh, I, I, I get fear too. I get that understanding out of an empathetic space. Many of us have been in that space before. So I first want to congratulate Lieutenant Nazario for being the one who was de-escalating. Uh, that was a unique situation. You have an officer screaming at you five or six different things at the same time. Also promising that you're going to feel the lightning. 
Uh, you heard that I, when situations like this, they rarely test the officers to see what they're dealing with and whether they're under the influence, because all I heard from that officer was continual slurred speech. Everything that was he was saying was slurred. Uh, I would have been terrified, too. I would have been concerned, too. Uh, he, I don't know if I would have kept it as calm. I don't know if any of us could have kept it as calm as Lieutenant Nazario did. Maybe that's a testament to his military background, too, uh, because even when he told them and acknowledged that they were afraid, that he was afraid, they said, quote, you should be. Uh, when you when you face that, when somebody tells you, when somebody has the gun on you and you're staring down the, ba the barrel of the gun, I don't know how many of you have had that experience of staring down a, battle of, a barrel of a gun. I have personally, there's nothing like that. And when somebody is, is expressing intent to light you up, to stay calm like that, we've got to give him his kudos. I think the Attorney General is right for bringing this uh, suit against the town of Windsor. They're asking for some very concrete things. They're asking for a court order that will make sure that they follow the rules that they're supposed to follow, not just with the Constitution, but with any federal act that is going to get passed in any time, uh, any uh, period coming soon. Uh, they're asking for third party supervision of this department that is also paid at the expense of department. When we talk about oversight committees and, and, and police oversight, we can see that those things, those, those institutions can often be corrupted by particularly police unions. So to have a third party that is disattached could actually bring about some justice. And the last thing I think they're asking for is a, a $50,000 fine for each count uh, of discrimination that they find with the police department going forward because while blacks and latinos are the minority in that town over 40 percent of them constitute the traffic stops so there is hard evidence to show that something is wrong there and i hope that it gets corrected with the suit that's that's on the table right now um all right folks so speaking of a lawsuit uh you've got uh, uh new york attorney general uh leticia james who has issued uh, subpoenas for uh, two of Donald Trump's children to testify in the civil uh, investigation. Uh, but uh, Donald Trump Jr. and Ivanka were like, nah, we ain't answering no questions about the father's real estate company. Uh, lawyers for Trump's family, they are blocking James from speaking with their clients. And last month, uh, uh, Trump sued James in their civil probe trying to get it stopped. He accused the New York Attorney General of participating in partisan politics. Um, it's a, I know it's a civil trial. Um, I say arrest their asses. I'm so, I'm, I'm so sick of these grifters. I'm, a Congo, I'm so sick of these grifters. I'm so, all of them. Donald Trump, Jr., Ivanka Trump, oh. Erica Trump, they grifting daddy, all of them. Absolutely, man. And look, I, you know, we see all this talk about, you know, the insurrection and how, you know, uh, Trump could come back into office. And I keep saying, where is what, what's going on of all of these New York investigations? There's civil investigations, <laughs> right. there's criminal ones. I mean, all of the things that they've done, money laundering, like all of these things, and nothing is happening. And I'm like, yo, if they could just expedite those joints, we wouldn't have to worry about Trump in 2024. And yo, I'm just saying, it's just when these guys will continually obstruct justice in every way, shape, or form, whether it's relating to the company, whether it's relating to how much they knew about what was going on with the insurrection, they cannot keep getting away with this. And, and, and I so much applaud Sister James for everything that she's doing. And yes, I know they can't report every single step of these investigations to us, but really at the end of the day, these guys have been doing this for decades. It's not like it's brand new. And folks in New York have always known what's going on. Well, what was it the former mayor who said, I know a con when I see one? They got all of this stuff, man. And so, yeah, I guess justice is supposed to move in the proper way and not be expedited. But these guys are corrupt in every way, shape, or form. And form. And Ivanka and Jared, you know, her husband Jared tried to play it off by looking all calm and not being all boisterous like Don Jr. and they're like, but they're all the same, man. It's a criminal enterprise and they need to be held accountable civilly as well as criminally. So I'm hoping that this moves a little bit faster in 2022. Um, absolutely. All right, folks, got to go to a break. We come back. Our Fit Live Win segment with the Diet Doctor, Dr. Terry Starks. He says, look, forget everything that you hear. You want to lose weight, you've got to eat five times a day. And he said, forget all that crap, not eating after 8 p.m. He said, no, the key is getting your five five bills in. But he'll explain next. Roland Martin Unfiltered right here on the Black Star Network, our first show of 2022. Back in a moment.
Black women have always been essential. Mm -hmm. So now mm -hmm. how are you going to pay us like that? And it's not just the, the salary. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are a whole number of issues that have to support us as women. Yeah. But that's what we deserve. Mm -hmm. that we shouldn't have to beg anybody for that. And I think that we are trying to do our best as a generation to honor the fact that we didn't come here alone and we didn't come here by accident. I always say every generation has to define for itself yeah. what it means to move the needle forward. Mm -hmm. I'm Angie Stone. Hi, I'm Teresa Griffin. Oh, Roland. <laughs> hey, Roland. I am so disappointed that you are not here, first of all. Um, where's our dance? It's like we get a dance in every time I see you. And so now you're not here for me to dance with, sir. You and your ascot. I need it. I need that in my life right now. Okay. Um, I love you, Roland. What's up? I'm Lance Gross, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. <laughs> All right, folks, uh, it is January 3rd, first show of the year. And, of course, as always, folks, they want to start a new. They got resolutions. They're trying to change what to eat. They're trying to change workout, all kind of different stuff. And uh, my next guest says, he said, look, y'all want to lose weight? I'm trying to tell y'all. He said, you got to get the five meals in if you want to lose weight. But. That's kind of what a lot of other people say. Joining us right now is uh, Terry Starks, the Diet Doctor. Terry, glad to have you on the show. Uh, so, so first off, uh, why are you so adamant? Explain why are you so adamant about the five meal that you got to get all five in. All right. So, I'm, I'm, I'll give you an example, Roland. The human body is like a fireplace. Once you've got logs in the fireplace, that fire is up. It's blazing that room is warm. As the fire starts to die down, well, what do you have to do next? Well, you've got to throw more logs into that fireplace. Here comes that fire. Now that room is nice and warm again. Around that two and a half hour mark, three hour mark, the fire starts to die down. You've got to throw more logs into the fireplace. The human body is the same way, the same exact way. You feed the body, a small meal, give that, give that meal, you know, two and a half hours, enough time to digest. And then you have to fuel the body with another small meal. Give it two and a half hours, a little bit more time to digest. So at that three hour mark, you fuel it with another small meal. This is how you speed up the metabolism. I know this sounds weird, but mostly people weren't struggling with weight loss because they're overeating. 85% of them aren't eating enough. I'm helping. Now, 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 now that's, interesting. that's interesting you say not eating, enough. Not eating enough. Be because you have others who say, oh, if, if you do three meals and not, not, not now, one of the things I kept hearing all in 2021, intermittent fasting, intermittent fasting, and, 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 and all sort of stuff like that, whereas – Whereas your deal is, look, if you want to take the weight off, you know, it's it, it's in it, this it's the time frame. And you also make it you also say, stop with all this. Don't eat after seven or eight o'clock. Right. It's really based exactly. upon your own schedule, your lifestyle. Exactly. So for an example, 30 um, percent of my clients that are really drop in two, three, three dress sizes in 35 days, they work the third shift. I'll get a call from nurse practitioners, even physicians like, well, Terry Starks, how is it you've got men and women eating at midnight, one, two, three o'clock in the morning, and their bodies are changing drastically? I'm like, well, they work the third shift. He said, but we thought you got to stop eating after three and starve yourself for the rest of the day. That's absolutely false. My clients that work overnight, they're up eating. And generally, they're sleeping during the day. The body doesn't really tell time. It just wants to be fueled. 
And again, Roland, I want to say this. I'm 50 years old. I've been maintaining my weight loss since 1988. Make sure. Can you hear me, Roland? Yeah, we can hear you. Now, now, that's a, now, y'all, now, 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 Terry doesn't post a lot of photos of him uh, uh, on social. This is a photo he posted from October. Um, uh, and so uh, so just so y'all you might be thinking, man, well, you know, what does this guy look like? Well, that, that's what he looks like. Go ahead, Terry. <laughs> right. Thanks, bro. Yeah. So it, it's just you know, I'm, I'm more into a healthy lifestyle change. Um, you, you know, w once you do the program, and you reach your desired uh, look or clothing size, I have an 85-15 rule. So I always explain to my clients, like, well, what about maintaining the weight loss? Well, that's the easy part. I've been maintaining my weight loss for 33 years. I never said you wouldn't have ice cream, cookies, and cake. Let me get this weight off you first so you can enjoy ice cream, cookies and cake, of course, in moderation. So, so, so the thing is, and, and, and so like, like, here's a, uh, a photo of a brother, uh, you, uh, you work with, you have posted, uh, on social media. And, and one of the things that you do, you want your folks taking photos, shirt off and shirt on, because exactly. what you folk, what you focus on is how do your clothes fit? You're right. not fixed. You're not fixated on the scale. Exactly. Explain, explain I, I'm that. more interested in the image in the mirror and not numbers on the scale. Nobody would know what you weigh unless you what you weigh unless you tell them. And and honestly, Roland, we're not judged based off of what we weigh. We're judged based off of how we look. My job is to make sure you look amazing. Once we're finished, well, whatever you happen to weigh is what you weigh. It is what it is to God be the glory. But I guarantee you, you will look phenomenal. That's the key. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, when we when I was uh, late last year working out, losing weight, and folks were like, oh, my God, I mean, you lost so much weight. Really, it wasn't. It wasn't, you know, it was people kept saying, man, you got to be exercising. We've had numerous people on the show. You don't you're not losing weight because of exercise. You're losing it because of your diet. Uh, and and I think um, I think the first week of uh, the first week working with you, I think I lost either nine or 11 pounds that week. And the thing that and, and the thing that was the thing that was that was that was weird about it, because you also make it clear you got to drink lots of water as well, that yeah. and that by, 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 by measuring, you know, uh, by measuring the food in terms of ounces. Uh, the vegetables mm -hmm. and the chicken, whatever, and, eat, and, and eating every three hours, right. it didn't give me these long gaps of six, eight hours where, oh my God, I'm really, really hungry. And that, that, that to me, because it, so it wasn't like I was starving. I was, I was replenishing myself. So I was always full versus before I would have these long stretches mm -hmm. uh, of working and going. And then all of a sudden I may not eat for nine hours. And then now it's like, man, you want to buy everything in front of you. Exactly. Exactly. So that's and that's going back to that fireplace uh, mentality. I like to keep fuel in the body, you know, and this you can't eat five humongous meals in the day. That's impossible. Your stomach ain't that big, but you definitely can eat five tiny meals. And I it's all about portion control, portion control. Um, you know, another thing, too, I teach my clients focus on yourself. Everyone's body is different and, and therefore the journey may be a little bit different. A lot of people get discouraged because they're seeing somebody else lose weight faster than them. And it's okay. It may take you a little bit longer to get the weight off. You're still going to get it off. There's a lot of variables we have to take into consideration. Health complications, um, age, you know, it's, there's a lot of things that can slow the process down, but the way the human body works, if you're fit, fueling the body, clean, healthy meals, if you're doing something to stay active, the human body is forced to slowly transform. It's a scientific guarantee. Questions uh, from my panelists. I'll start first with Omakongo. Um. Uh, can I borrow an ab or like, yeah. <laughs> you know, just, you know, I'm just, um, 
you know, I'm just saying it, it help a brother out this new year. Well, listen, uh, well, first, here's the thing. You have a nice six pack. You just have a, you've got a layer of fat covering it up. We'll just strip the fat off you so you can show your abs. Everybody has abs. Everybody has it. So to, to that end, uh, what, what my question would be, for people, uh, we understand when you talk about like not making New, Year, New Year's resolutions, it's about the lifestyle. Yes. But when you talk about w- what are some of the types of food that you feel your clients start to stop eating first in mm-hmm. order to get them on their path? Or is it more sugar stuff, more sodium? You know, mm-hmm. what are some of the things that get them started on the right path of meeting these goals? Well, the first thing, uh, you know, I do like to eliminate a lot of the sugar out of my diet and and a lot of the sodium out of the diet first. But it's it's all mental when it comes to the weight loss. L- let me give you a, a, a great example. When it comes to hot wings, there's a lot of different hot wings. There's mild wings, barbecue barbecue wings. There's hot wings, there's tight wings, there's lemon pepper wings. Even when it comes to eating unhealthy, there's a huge variety. So you have to have that same mindset when it comes to eating healthy. So on my, say on my fish weeks, well, there's a ton of different ways I prepare my fish. I'll use the oven, I use my air fryer, I'll use, I'm old school, I still have my George Foreman grill. I I use my outdoors grill. I use the stove top. It's all about being creative. And I get it, eating healthy can be redundant at times, but I don't eat food because of the taste. I eat for the beneficial factors. I eat for, you know, having perfect health and, and looking good and feeling good. We just have to be a little bit more creative when we're uh, making the healthy choices. That's the key. Um, I'm going to uh, gonna go to Avis. Hi there. So in terms of making that mental shift uh, that you spoke about, you know, what do you think is one of the things, the, the tips that you can give people in terms of getting them out of uh, the habits that they have sort of ingrained in their lifestyles for potentially decades before they uh, before they met you, I think. Well, okay. the first thing we have to be patient. Yeah. The second thing you have to look in the mirror. The scale can say whatever it wants, but honey, the mirror always tells the truth. That mirror won't lie. You know, <laughs> it's just being patient and be, and being consistent. All I'm doing, if I'm even doing anything different with all the people that I'm transforming, first of all, I'm holding them up accountable and i'm teaching them how to compete against themselves compete against the person in the mirror that's that's it and that's what everybody's doing that's why the weight is coming off that's why the inches are are melting that's you know she only lost that that's one of my sister greeks of, of sigma gamma rho she only lost i don't know 12 pounds in 35 days hmm. but how does she look she only lost 12 pounds. Mm-hmm. The mirror never lies. The scale can say whatever it wants. The mirror says she looks great. Jeff. Yeah, the, uh, first off, Dr. Starks, I want to thank you for the work that you're doing. Obviously, you're living and walking in your divine purpose, and that's what we need more of all around the board. Uh, what I found, um, I know that the, the five meals a day works because of the stimulation of the metabolism and it's a consistent thing and if we don't eat we starve ourselves and our bodies end up storing fat because they think it needs the energy that hurts us in the long term but our our the six most dangerous words that i i've encountered with people um i ain't got time for that right so when you when you hear that i know you've heard that a lot but for people who are watching or who may be thinking you know i want to do something to not only lose the weight but I want to be able to keep the weight off and build a lifestyle of consistency. So for people out there who are looking at building something that's sustainable, what tips do you have to give to people who want to get started and be able to create a diet that lasts, especially if they have to also prepare for their family and kids? Well, so when I put um, you know, new clients on my program, 
the first thing I, I explain to them is, listen, everybody in the household can benefit from healthy eating. Mm -hmm. Everybody can benefit from healthy eating. I just signed up a, a housewife, you know, she's a size 18. I guarantee you I'll get her down to a 14 in 35 days. Guarantee. That goes without saying. Her husband is like, well, I want to lose weight too. Mm -hmm. And I say, well, listen, if you eat with your wife, you're going to slowly lose. He said, well, no, 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 no. I want to do more than lose weight. I want a six pack. I said, okay, well, I have to create something specifically for you. Now you're speaking my language. He's like, no, I want the abs to pop. But as far as the in the household, everybody should be eating healthy in the household. Mm -hmm. Everybody should be eating healthy. Um, and, and, and that's always been my number one rule. It just depends on what a person's goals are uh, you have to figure out you know what motivates you for me i lost nine family members because of poor eating habits growing up mm -hmm. that was my motivation i'm trying to be around so i can live to see my kids yeah. kids kids that's the game plan and this is why i make the healthy choices that's great all right uh terry how can folks reach you have them they can reach me on instagram terry starts the diet doctor i've got two facebook pages if you just search for terry starts you'll see thousands of transformations just you know inbox me or my email i'm old school rolling terry starts one at aol.com just let me know you're ready for your transformation and let's make sure you're the best version of yourself that's what we can all right then folks uh so uh that's it so uh, you know how to reach him uh terry thank you so very much i appreciate you rolling thank you guys all right thanks a lot folks uh of course this is uh already just three days into um uh 2022 and we've lost uh, uh some great ones uh, already uh first off uh nick coleone uh the smooth jazz guitarist uh he had five number one singles uh from his album he was, he was of course a native of chicago mitchell Chu. last living um, uh, parent of the four girls who were killed in Birmingham uh, bomb. Uh, Maxine McNair's daughter, uh, first of all, uh, Ma Maxine McNair was 93 years old, passed away in Birmingham. Her daughter, Carol Denise McNair, was 11 years old when a KKK member placed a bomb uh, at the 16th Street Baptist Church uh, that killed her and three other girls. Uh, Maxine McNair was a school teacher for 33 years in Birmingham public school system. Uh, and uh, she passes away uh, at the age of uh, 93. And so we certainly uh, mourn her loss as well. And then also uh, he starred in the Mac. Max Julian mm. uh, passed away uh, on New Year's Day, his birthday. Uh, and uh, all the reports keep saying he was 88, but he was born in 45, according to the report. So he was, that means he was actually 77. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, Max Julian was a screenwriter. Uh, he was also, uh, again, like I say, he starred, starred in the Mac. Uh, and uh, so, so many people remember uh, that film and so many others. And so we lost some great ones uh, already. Uh, so we mourn the passing uh, of Maxine McNair, Nick Coleon, as well as uh, Max Julian. I uh, want to thank uh, Greg Avis and Omakongo for being on today's show. We ended uh, <laughs> last week's show. Jeff uh, Rowland. Jeff. We ended Yes, we didn't let Sarge talk about my back. Yeah, yeah, see? <laughs> said, said, hey, yeah. man, that's all right. <laughs> so uh, let, we, we ended the show Thursday showing you uh, folks who we lost in 2021. There was some we, we did not, we, some we left off. And so we wanted to show you a complete memoriam uh, in today's show uh, with that. And so we'll do so. Uh, so we'll see you guys tomorrow right here on Roller Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network.